everybody. Thank you so much for joining the Maryland Center for History and Culture for today's virtual program. My name is Chloe Green. I am the Public Programs and Outreach Manager here at MCHC and always happy to be here uh, having these virtual programs with everybody. We're happy to welcome you all here today for a special conversation the impact of Sesame Street on early childhood education in Maryland with a few extra tidbits thrown in there throughout the conversation. We're gonna learn a lot of great stuff today. Um, so this program is happening in honor of the famous puppeteer, Jim Henson, who was one of the creators of Sesame Street, a very long lasting and very impactful educational program. And also happening in honor of the traveling exhibition, the Jim Henson exhibition, Imagination Unlimited, happening here and on view until December 30th, 2023. And I will send a link to that exhibit shortly. But I would like to begin by thanking PNC for sponsoring today's program, as well as all of our programming dedicated to early childhood learning and development. We appreciate their support so much, and we've been able to do a lot of great things and connect with a lot of great families and a lot of great people. Um, I would also like to give a warm welcome to today's host, Danny Labreck, host and moderator. Danny Labreck, the founder and creator of Danny Joe's Treehouse and host of Cookies for Breakfast, which is a really wonderful podcast, but I will not say too much about it. I'm going to let Jan Danny jump on here and introduce himself more. Um, so thank you, Danny, for your time and your expertise today. We're all super excited for this conversation, and I'm going to go ahead and leave things to you. Thanks, everybody. Uh, sorry, what? What's that, Chloe? I couldn't quite. I couldn't quite hear you. I'm sorry. What was? What'd you say? Sorry, there's a banana in my ear. <laughs> I'm setting the bar high. Uh, a little shout out to Bert and Ernie. Hi, hi everybody. Welcome. What an honor. What an honor uh, to moderate this conversation with my colleagues here in Maryland, in Maryland. Thank you so much for uh, joining us from all around the country. I know we've got a lot of great friends in the field of early childhood education and early childhood development and children's media and puppetry. And uh, we really want to hear your voices along the way. Uh, as Chloe said, uh, I am the creator and host of Danny Joe's Treehouse. It is a uh, loving tribute to the earliest days of children's television, going back to Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, and even before that, Kukla, Fran, and Ollie, and uh, Ding Dong School with Miss Frances. Uh, we, we love that retro look and feel, but we also speak to this moment, this social moment. Uh, my wife and I work directly with Baltimore Early Learning. I do interactive live streams into Baltimore City schools, and uh, I also go out in person and interact with kids throughout the city in schools and libraries. And we truly listen to how kids are feeling. It's not just coming in and telling kids what we think they should be thinking about. We listen to where they are at in this social moment. That is a cue that we learned from the shows we grew up with, like Sesame Street. Um, and we hope you might check that out. Dangerous Treehouse streams on Sensical TV, which is backed by Common Sense Media. We are also on YouTube Kids. And a few weeks ago, we were uh, very happy to find out that we were holding the number one top global show spot on YouTube Kids for our work in early childhood development and mental health um, through the language of play. So check out our series, uh, if you will. We'd, we'd love to see you there at the old treehouse, at Danny Joe's treehouse. Uh, I am joined today by colleagues in the world of puppetry and early childhood education and uh, Maryland Public Television. So please join us, my friends. Leonard, Carla, come on in. Come on in. These are the people in your neighborhood, in your neighborhood. <laughs> Len Leonard. Uh, Leonard Corbin Jr. Uh, has been in the field of puppetry for over 30 years. He is a gifted communicator. He's a pastor. Um, he connects through the art of puppetry in the most beautiful way. And Leonard, uh, could you please speak more to not only the business of what you do, but why you do what you do? Uh, thank you, uh, Danny. So uh, as Danny said, uh, I am a children's, been a children's pastor for over 30 years we've been doing this, me, my wife, and three sons. 
as soon as a, one of my sons was old enough to hold a puppet, we taught them how to do it. And I and our business is one of we 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 have we operate a uh, a faith and community based organization, and so we're not limited to just churches. We we want to reach children everywhere because we realize that all children don't go to church, but they still need the opportunity to learn and experience and understand things. And uh, a puppetry has been our way of going out and reaching those families, children, explaining to them things, and letting them know that they are important and letting them know that they can experience things. And that's basically what our uh, puppetry, uh, we call it an outreach theater, have been doing. We've been going to schools. We've, <clears throat> excuse me, we've traveled from Bermuda to Oak, to West Virginia, uh, uh, Ohio, from New York to North Carolina. And we've had the experience of uh, sharing puppetry uh, for 30, 30, in September it will be 31 years. Wow. Well, happy anniversary. Thank talk you. about, talk about impact. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll learn more about that. And I'm really excited to get um, your perspective. And I want to hear about your personal relationship to um, Sesame Street and how it influenced your work as a, as okay. a younger, a younger person. Um, not that you're not young now, Look, <laughs> you, you, you kid you. <laughs> um, Carla, Carla Thompson. Uh, so Carla is the director of pre-K through uh, 12 learning and design at Maryland Public Television, our local affiliate station for PBS. Um, she has a background in early childhood education and development that goes back. And uh, Carla, same question. Uh, talk about your, your work here in Maryland, but also why you do what you do. I know, it, I know it's much more than just a job. It's, 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 it's a mission to you. Uh, most definitely. And first and foremost, I'm really excited to share this space with, with you and with Leonard to, to talk about this and to share resources and, and give some insight. But um, yes, as in my role at, at MPT, you know, I do a lot of work around the design and development and delivery of resources that support early child care providers, as well as um, K through 12 um, classrooms, the students is, and the teachers in those classroom settings. But when I think about what brought me to MPT, um, I have a background in early childhood special ed. I spent a lot of time in Baltimore City Head Start system as a special ed consultant, as a disability coordinator. And I remember being um, in the kitchen, actually waiting to do an assessment with a child. And it was at St. Vincent de Paul Head Start, as a matter of fact. And I saw this flyer for this um, upcoming conference that MPT was hosting about um, Between the Lions and using these resources to support learning and development. And I'm like, well, my goodness, I like that. <laughs> and at that point, I was the mother of a two-year-old son who Between the Lions was how I, you know, did a lot of things. And um Sesame Street, you know, falls right into that category. And it was, it was my connection to the content as a mother um, that really led me into the work that I'm doing now with and through MPT. You know, I have my own memories as a child, but um, so much of what my work centers on and what my mission and goal is, is to serve as a bridge to, co to help connect incredible resources incredible content and the strategies to bring them to life in early childhood program settings, whether family, um, family care settings, center-based settings and beyond, but helping to serve as that bridge to build awareness and, and make our communities know what's available to support them when they do the incredible work that they do for young children and families here in Maryland. Mm, it's such important work. Again, that word impact is coming up. Um, uh, so folks, uh, who are joining in and watching, we, we, this, you know, it's not like back in the day, it is not passive screens today. It is interactive screens and we really do want to hear from you. So I'm going to give a couple prompts along the way. Uh, the first prompt is going to be, I'd like you to think about, um, a moment from, uh, Sesame street, um, 
multi multi generational show. How did Sesame Street uh, impact you? What's a moment that you you can't get out of your mind that really influenced you as an adult? Um, my my memory that I often go back to, besides Ernie with a banana in his ear, is um, when Mr. Hooper died. That was such a special uh, episode. And as a kid, there was there was death in in our home and being allowed to talk about death in an authentic way that show modeled um, openness and acceptance. And that really influenced not only me as a child, but my the adults in my world too. And that, that had a real lasting effect. Um, I'm gonna uh, throw those two questions to each of our uh, panelists today. Uh, and then we will get into the, um, the, um, the, the meat of our conversation. The meat of our conversation? I have to find a different word. The banana of our conversation. We'll peel the banana. Uh, but let Leonard, um, w could you speak about when you first saw Sesame Street, the impact it had on you? If there's a moment from Sesame that really influenced you um, and 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 your work. Okay, sure. So I remember the very first time I saw Sesame Street. I think I was 13, 12 years old. And when I saw it, I said to myself, I enjoyed it, the program, I enjoyed all the characters and whatnot, but something inside of me said, I want to learn how to do that. Mm -hmm. And so that was my very first experience. I thought it was a, a, a fascinating uh, talent to learn, to know how to do. Uh, I guess because I was a little bit older than the target audience, I didn't look at it in, in, with the thrill and delight of maybe a, a younger child. I just saw it as this is a way to reach children. And so I wanted to be a part of that. Uh, and isn't, isn't that one of the most special things about Sesame Street? Like we, we all think of it um, as a preschool program. But really, if you're serving a preschooler, you are serving the whole family. Every early childhood educator understands that. You you are there to back up not just the child, but the child's adults in their lives. Um, so it's not it's not just a program for 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 children. Um, that's that's awfully that's awfully special. Um, I'm, I'm excited to talk about um, Leonard and I have gotten the chance to know each other off screen, and I'm excited to get into one of those um, moments of using puppetry to connect with a young child. Um, but, but Carla, uh, what what was a moment for you that pops into your head with uh, uh, watching Sesame Street as as a parent or as a child, or both? Right. You know, it's interesting because I think um, as a child, what struck me wasn't so much moments, but I remember like Snuffleupagus was my most favorite character. And as I grew with Sesame Street, Abby, Abby Kadabi became my most favorite character. And the reasons why was because of the way that for me, they celebrated imagination and just the joy of wonder. Um, and Abby and that magic wand. And, you know, it's just, um, for me, that wonder is like the innocence of childhood, you know, the wondering why. And I don't know why I was so attracted to Snuffleupagus, but I just really appreciated him. <laughs> um, oh, sure. But I think a lot of different um, segments of the show that I watched as a child that I've looked at differently in the role that I've done now and how, um, to your point, that um, Sesame Street created a place where you, for who you are, are the greatest asset in that space and place. So no matter what it is that you bring to the table and however you present that because of who you are, it's always welcomed. There may be questions, but they were answered with respect, um, right. curiosity, um, a wanting to understand. And I think my biggest takeaway from that is the fact that we all are sharing what it is to be human, but how we do it is a little bit different. <laughs> um, so if we can connect into that that shared understanding part, I think that's one of the priceless gems that that Sesame Street helps us to to remember. Absolutely. 
it's not it's not a one sided screen. I and mean, we have these interactive mm -hmm. screens now, but even back in sixty nine, it was it was two way communication. Few mm -hmm. few people really had that gift of connecting through the screen and get, and not just the pausing for a response. A lot of people in my field will will go that that route of waiting for a one one response and a close ended question. But it was very much um, the 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 sense of just just echoing what you said this is my show i'm i'm part of this this community they really do see me maybe they don't see me through the screen but they seem to speak to what i'm thinking about in this moment and that balance of the silly silly stuff mm -hmm. but also the serious stuff you brought up abby kadabi very recently in the episode abby was talking with gordon about her parents getting a divorce right and it's one of the most heartfelt conversations um I've seen in a long time. And I and I know now they're doing a lot of work where they are specifically talking to adults. Like children will enjoy it too, but it is support for parenting and 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 teachers of how how to negotiate complex issues. I wanted to share some of the things that are coming through in in uh uh chat. Um, <laughs> um Vanessa shares uh, a nice memory of the singing ping pinball machines one two three oh, four yeah. five six seven eight, nine. <laughs> how, how long has that been stuck in your head uh the follow that bird uh movie sticking with with blake um throughout many years uh, is still one of his favorite movies i think that was the first time i truly cried in a film and it wasn't it was satisfying it wasn't something to be scared of it was okay to feel that empathy for big bird on his journey they they just didn't shy away from those sort of things um wendy rath shares i remember a uh, fish in a fish bowl he was losing water because a child kept running the water i remember this too running the water while brushing his teeth he asked the child to turn the water off while brushing the teeth i still think of that you know speak speaking to current social issues in a safe and objective way that's a real that's a real art and i think i'm going to use that to uh get into to open up the banana <laughs> of uh part of this conversation uh we've met a few times before um the live stream about how we wanted to approach impact um here in maryland we're focusing on maryland but also around around the country and we thought we would look at the parallels between 1969 when sesame street first came out and today in um, 2023 the uh, sesame street very much reflects the social moment and i want to share a little bit of history um this i'm going to cite um uh the the folks at um at black history unlocked black history 365 for um, this research, but it was, they said it so succinctly, and I, I wanted to uh, use this as a, a kicking off point for the, the conversation today. Uh, November 10th, 1969, the world was introduced to Sesame Street. The show um, has been rooted in black culture, specifically historical black, the historical black community of Harlem, the New York City neighborhood uh, played a major role in the development of the show from the design of the set. It was a real place. Um, so, so many children's shows at that time were fantasyful. Um, I don't know if that's the right word or not. They were in tree houses like me. They were in um, magical lands, but this was a street. This is where people really did live. It was reflective of the community um, that was not being um, served or represented necessarily at that time in, in children's television. Um, Joan Gans Cooney, the creator of Sesame Street, said in a 1998 interview that a documentary she produced on the Harlem preschool program that would later become Head Start led her to, quote, become absolutely involved intellectually and spiritually with the civil rights movement and the educational deficit that poverty created. Um, Later, Cooney um, would team up with Lloyd Morissette, a psychologist and, uh, and Carnegie Corporation executive who is uh, looking to back preschool uh, education models. And again, saw the importance of representation at that time. The country was beyond divided um, and kids needed to be seen and truly heard. And so same thing with their, their adults. 
um, Chester Pierce, a black psychiatrist and Harvard professor, helped design what he called the show's, quote, hidden curriculum, end quote, to build up the self-worth of black children through the presentation of positive black, black images. Pierce was also uh, all, but Pierce also insisted that the show present integrated, harmonious community to challenge the division of Black Americans at that time in 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 our society. Um, and what do you know? Um, what do you know? Uh, a few, just a few months into the release of that show, um, it was banned. Uh, less than six months later. In the All White State Commission for Educational Television in Mississippi, in Mississippi um, words um, that um, echoed a lot of the things we're hearing today with uh, the LGBTQ plus community and how they're represented um, on screen and in libraries and in schools. There was major pushback, but the individuals around the country, the people who were receiving it on the other side of the screen and seeing their communities um, represented authentically, not in a perfect world. There were still conflicts on Sesame Street, but they could talk through it. They could play through it. It wasn't just silly stuff. It wasn't just using the tools of commercialism and advertising to teach academics, so that, that, was, that was a very important part of the show. It was about so, the social issues of the time and speaking to that moment. And people around the country said, we have to have this type of communication. Our children deserve it. And they're still going. Sesame Street is still serving us. Um, what an amazing gift to society. Um, as we look at 1969 and today and those parallels, I'm very curious what comes up in your mind. Think, you know, we, we as adults think of the nostalgia of Sesame Street and we kind of started to talk about, about it um, a little bit, but think about things that we're seeing today on Sesame Street, what the, the moment that they are speaking to through the language of play. Um, think of quarantine, um, think of the war in Ukraine, um, Carla, I know you've you've had some thoughts about some of the recent um, 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 things that uh, Sesame Street has been doing for our, our community. Can you think of a few examples that really stand out to you? Sure, and I think what it is is that you know, at its inception, Sesame Street was created with intention, with mm -hmm. research, with um, a research-based approach to make an impact on the learning. Um, of these young children who lived in a space and place where they were marginalized. And so um, what I, for me, what is really consistent around Sesame Street is the fact that that thread is consistent throughout. And to today, the same exists, um, more research, more best practice, you know, continued best practice, setting the bar for um, best practices, and really not ever shying away from what is a hard conversation. You know, um, an episode that sticks out in my mind is the 9-11 um, episode where they had to deal, they're living in New York. So they did not shy away from what was real and true for the city, for the country, for the world and what was happening. And they respect a child's intelligence to be able to navigate that with support of adults. And, um, you know, bringing, bringing in characters, um, you know, recently they've introduced a Filipino American Muppet character. Mm -hmm. um, we had Julia who has autism, who was um, introduced in the past few years. You know, we, we, we have the opportunity to engage with different ethnicities, races, backgrounds, um, and explore what kind of social constructs, you know, these characters uh, might be facing that are mirrored in our day-to-day -day society. So um, again, it, so many little instances come to mind, but what it is for me is the fact that they have resources that support the adults. To your point much earlier when you said that, you know, children don't exist outside the the unit of their family and families look different, but they have a, a family unit 
And if they're experiencing homelessness, you know, who are the adults who are supporting them? If they're in foster care, who are the, how are they being supported? But all of those subjects, all of those topics, um, Sesame has intentionally and thoughtfully created resources to support learning how to have those hard conversations, how to support academic learning, how to um, nurture social emotional development for young children. And through their um, website, sesameworkshop.org, all of those resources are available to parents as well to um, the edu early childhood educators who are in the programs with, with children so that it's a continuum of support. And at, at the center, at the fulcrum is the child, but how are the adults working and living and loving those children? Um, how can we best support them? And that's what Sesame has done an incredible job of creating re resources to support military families mm -hmm. with transition. How do you have conversations with children around divorce? What is this thing called COVID? Why did I have to get a shot? Why are you getting a shot? Why can't I go anywhere? Um, and it's all through digital games. It's all through storybooks. It's all through articles and um, additional support. So there's a wealth of content and resources available there that um, support the efforts that they do. A couple of different thoughts popped up as you were sharing uh, those important perspectives. Um, again, I think uh, every uh, quality early childhood educator specialist um, understands that it is next to impossible to teach the academics shapes colors numbers if you don't have a strong social emotional foundation if you don't know you're safe if you don't know where your food is coming from if, if you're dealing with the big world which young children really do we forget that sometimes the big world impacts young children if if there's not that that strength that inner strength there the academic stuff it's very hard to retain um, those those mm -hmm. things um, and that modeling of behavior also from the adults on screen as caregivers um, certainly can can be surrogates in some ways for young children and modeling for for other adults too who might feel overwhelmed Lord knows, um, during um, uh, quarantine and all things COVID, a lot of adults got a real good reminder of what it's like to be a young child, a very young child, striving for independence. When is it going to be over? When do we get to move forward? But at the same time, wanting the touchstone of when do we get to go back to the way it was? What's right. my security? Waiting for the rules and the rules changing and the authority changing their mind all the time. Like we, we really did experience some regression mentally to that state of the young child. But that can be a very healthy thing. Regression follows up with the springboard. Um, Leonard, I think, I think you can speak to the importance of puppetry here and how there, there's the live action elements of Sesame Street, but the thing that punches through to the um, you know, one foot in reality, one foot in make-believe or fantasy or the dream world, it's that puppet. That puppet um, is a vessel. It is a way for the kid to come in um, and and for the adult caregiver to meet the child in in a in a way that's not overwhelming, you know, like the adult looking right in and lecturing through the screen. There's something about having that safe um, safe play language of play. Can can you speak to a moment when you first experienced that? We've talked about the hospital experience, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to um, to tell your story, but could you speak about that a little bit? Okay, sure. The first thing I, I want to say that certainly that Sesame Street is a microcosm of the world that we live in today. And I'm so thankful for that. And then too, I'm reminded of a time when someone told an analogy of a ball. They said, if you take a ball and put it amongst children who are ethnically different, uh, they don't even speak the same language. They're from different parts of the world, culturally different. They learn how to play. And there's no uh, uh, schisms or there are no distractions among them. They just play. Well, Sesame Street is that ball. It, it has become that ball. And so regardless of what language we speak, where we come from, who we love, we're able to learn in that microcosm that is the ball that is 
a Sesame Street. That's a beautiful and so to your point about the, uh, uh, I remember one occasion when I got a phone call from one of our, our, our children who was in the hospital and I was going, uh, running out to go and visit them. And on the way out the door, uh, puppet was right by the door. I just grabbed the puppet instinctually and went out the door. When I got to uh, the hospital, the parent was there and whatnot and all. And uh, I asked the child, could I pray? Well, instead of praying normally, I let the puppet pray. And, uh, and then afterwards we had conversations. Now I'm not a ventriloquist. <laughs> so she could actually see me working the puppet, moving my mouth and whatnot. But the child paid no attention to me at all. They were just locked in and fixed in on that puppet. And that's what puppetry does. It locks us in to the message that was being taught, regardless of like uh, Frank Oz was saying, we're just holding, you know, we're dancing with dolls and whatnot. Well, that dancing doll is telling a, a critical message. And one of the things I think I shared with you, Danny, is that the puppets can say stuff that you and I can't say. If we say it, uh, uh, Carla, if we say it, they, uh, we've got uh, a finger wagging at us, or, mm -hmm. or people turn turn their attention away from us. But when that puppet says it, it is embraced, it is received, yes. and so that's the magic of the magic of puppetry. That's that ball that allows us to communicate, and not only with adult, uh, children, but adults receive it too. That's what I was going to say too. Yeah. In my thirty years of uh, of what we've been doing, it's the adults that get it. I had an adult, uh, I went to a conference at, at one of our churches and, and I was speaking and this lady came up to me and, afterwards and said, you're the puppet person, right? <laughs> I said, yeah. And she said, I recognize your voice. She said, I saw you five years ago with the puppets. And, and she didn't know who I was because I was behind the curtain. But she recognized the voice of the puppet that I was using. And so th those things stay with us. That message that we're doing, she said, my son always turns that, because she said, we videotaped it. And she said, I've been watching it for five years. And she wanted to know if I see it. So we're making impact into the lives of children and adults. So the message that we're bringing forth is very important, so very important to our listeners. And that's what Sesame Street does. Uh, um, it's it's impactful, it's relevant, and it's current. That's it. What a beautiful analogy. I'm never gonna forget the, the ball analogy. Um, and adults do, we need play just as much. It yeah. gets taken away from us, I think, as we get older, um, uh, but it's healthy to our, mental health. We, we need the language of play. Right. The, those of us in the arts, um, we're lucky and we're so fortunate that we have that outlet. I know a lot of people are here from the um, National Puppetry um, Festival. I know you've got thoughts on, on that. Um, so please, please join the conversation. Um, something that came to my mind uh, was how uh, when we're in that space of play, it's, it's almost like it's, you know, creating safe places. It's like going into a, a dream. You know, we have our waking state, we're taking in all of this information, we get overwhelmed, we finally rest at night, and our dreams take over, and these surreal, abstract interpretations of our day come in, and it might not make a whole lot of sense as we're experiencing that dream, or we try to tell the dream the next day, but it is a beautiful way to process. And I, I've always thought of a young child at play, act, active play. If you are really listening and reading in between the lines, it is like watching a lucid dreamer. You, you can see exactly what they have been experiencing, even if they don't have the words to say how they're feeling. Um, and I, I, yeah, I observe Sesame Street really um, understands that. They listen to children. They do so much research out in the community, um, which leads me to, um, back to you, Carla. When we think about resources in the classroom and also mm -hmm. for parents, um, how does uh, MPT um, facilitate um, these sort of conversations um, with, with Sesame Street for all, all of these big 
um, um, social experiences, academic mm -hmm. um, milestones? How, how does MBT help and, and support that? Yeah, definitely. Um, well, first and foremost, you know, we recognize the power of the relatable characters and the storylines and um, understand the role it can play to help support active learning in child care settings and family care settings. So a lot of the work that we do as part of our early childhood work um, through MPT is to provide approved training, you know, through the state where providers can join us in facilitated sessions. And one, they have a chance to network, but two, they engage in interactive discussions and large and small group activities in order to learn how do I use this media? What is, and even share some of this space, you know, how did I relate to this as a child? How then can this be relatable for the children and the families that I serve and work with? And then kind of get into the nuts and bolts of what are some developmentally appropriate ways of using media like Sesame Street? And, you know, Sesame Street is a very long program in and of itself. So in order to promote active viewing, we use clips from programs like Sesame Street to really hone in and introduce or um, serve as a springboard for play-based learning with children and, and guide providers through understanding with this clip, I can set this up um, and pair it with a hands-on activity to extend that learning, um, to nurture conversation by talking about um, whatever the clip is sharing, you know, engage, asking children open-ended questions and really um, tapping into that that processing, like you were saying, you know, when they're playing and they they may be recounting conversations that they've heard around them, but that's a sweet spot to support a child's understanding and give clarification and and build their their um, a, a stronger understanding of what they might be experiencing or living with, but also building those social emotional skills, building those um, pre readiness skills for school. All of those opportunities are are modeled, guided, and um, we kind of set providers up with action plans on how to move forward using um, early learning, I mean, early skills um, in media literacy for themselves, for the children they work with, and for their families. So thinkport.org is MPT's education portal, and we have learning resources specifically um, for uh, early childhood providers and educators. And while it's not just Sesame Street, Sesame Street is woven in there as uh, naturally and of course, but by enrolling in any of our, um, what we call early learning social trainings or any of our media literacy trainings, that would be a part of the experience for child care providers. And we understand the importance that um, what, our provider community is learning, they want to extend to their families because families want to know the same thing. You know, I want to do the best I can for my for my child. What what are some suggestions? What are some, some ideas? So we make sure that the educators who rely on us to provide them professional learning training also have family engagement resources. Again, we're the bridge that connects um, those providers to the resources to support the family unit. Such important, it's such important work. And I know so many affiliate stations of PBS are doing the same thing. And that's such a big part of Sesame Street. There's there's the show, which I kind of hesitate to even use the word show. There's the educational program um, that exists on its own through the screen, through the passive screen, traditional passive screen. Um, but Sesame Street, Jim Henson in general, they have never shied away from the newest um, tech. Right. Uh, I, I had the, the, I think this will build upon what you were saying. Um, I'll reach back here one moment. Um, I'm going to plug, I'm going to plug Craig Shimon's book, um, but I don't think he'll mind. This is a, a new book that Craig Shimon's written forward by Frank Oz um, called Sam and Friends, the story of Jim Henson's first television show, which started here in Maryland, by the way. And um, Craig, 
Craig talks a lot about how um, Jim wasn't afraid of commercialism. He wasn't afraid of the television it, it, or, or the new technology as it was coming out. He wanted to get ahead of it and he saw it as a communication tool. He was going to choose how to use the tool to get across his, his thoughts. And I think today, thinking of parallels, so often, I think more so adults, we get overwhelmed by technology. We're, we're right on the cusp mm -hmm. of the, a new stage of mass communication. And um, you know the flat experiences, passive experiences, these types of interactive experiences going into truly immersive experiences and all things AI, that can be very intimidating. Exactly. But Sesame Street is always thinking ahead. And, and how can we use this tool? We don't have to, uh, on Sesame Street, we talk, or Sesame Street, huh, I wish. On Danny Joe's Treehouse, we talk a lot about a stick. A lot of teachers, parents might see a stick and say, oh, don't pick that up. You might poke your eye out. You might hurt yourself. Don't play with it. There are those other teachers that say, oh, it's wonderful. You found a stick. You can do anything with it. You can draw with it. You can build with it. What, what else can you do with it? You, you might get hurt. You have to practice, learn how to do it. I'm here to support you. I'm mm -hmm. going to follow your lead. You, you need to learn how to use these tools. And I, I think that applies to um, the empowerment of young kids right now as, as we're feeling a bit intimidated on the tech side. We, we can choose how to use these tools. We can model that. Um, we don't have to be afraid of the commercial if we talk about what a commercial is, how does it work? Um, and that's all of the media literacy work. That's you media know, literacy. Being, yeah. being that discerning viewer. And that's why it's so important to, to help support that learning and understanding across the continuum. Because that's if the providers and the early um, childhood educators and the pre-K-2 teachers and if the family, if they're all understanding that, they can help support that same learning with children because as they grow into um, elementary students and middle school students and high school students and beyond, mm -hmm. those skills just continue to grow. They So how do we scaffold it from this ECE space and beyond is so much of what... Um, we're, we're working, you know, diligently to plant that seed around. And I would also say that Sesame was at the forefront of that too. Um, mm -hmm. You talked about the fact that, you know, they allow that time and space for processing and that, that, that pause to allow the viewer to respond or to consider and take in what, whatever the um, information is. But again, you know, that idea of active viewing, you know, it's not just a matter of just sit and watch. It's how do we actively um, engage with this media to not be afraid of it, to be thoughtful and, and intentional of how we're going to use it, <laughs> right? Um, well, I've heard so many um, Muppeteers. I'm sorry. They didn't oh, go ahead. I've heard so many Muppeteers talk about there's a big difference between stimulation. Look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. We see a lot of that in the world that I'm in on YouTube, which I do not sure. care about. They just look, 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 flash, flash, flash. Sesame Street did a little bit of that early on, but it was purposeful. It was using those techniques to teach something. And they've evolved over time. A very mm -hmm. long show has gone down to about half the time, and they really expand on those lessons. Um, but there's the, the difference between stimulation and true engagement. Like you mm -hmm. don't have to have a lot of flash and bang to truly connect through the, the screen and really hear each other. Um, uh, Leonard, you got a direct message from uh, Anne, Mr. Corbin, to your earlier point. When my son was little, I would use my bare hands as puppets when I would put him to bed each night. He never looked at my mouth doing the speaking, only watched my hands and talked back to them, uh, even and even pet them. <laughs> he, he listened to everything they told him. It's absolutely fascinating. It, it really it really is a powerful tool. And it doesn't have to be fancy. It does not have to be you don't have to have a Muppet. You know, those are cutting edge, amazing puppets. Another uh, uh, anonymous attendee uh, uh, talked about um, how important is the impact of the design of Sesame Street uh, Muppets, um, the flexibility and and the the way they could emote expression was very new. 
Um, the sort of puppets I work with are, are based on old school, hard face carved puppets, but the Muppets were something brand new. You, they really did seem alive. Um, but again, maybe you can speak more to that, Leonard. The, um, how, do, how do you, um, for you, how do, when you think about developing a, a character and a voice, how much of that is coming from you? How much of it is coming from the child? I, I know that's similar to a lot of Muppeteers approaches. So a, a lot of, uh, of times, like I said, we, we, we started, my children were young when we started. So I fed off of them a lot. We practiced on their reactions to what we were doing. It's, uh, it's very important to connect to your audience. Uh, I know I, when I was in seminary, we, we were taught that there are three parts of a message. The, you as the teacher, the audience and the message that you're trying to bring forth. And all three of them make the message. So we, we, we have to be mindful of who we're talking to and what the message is that we're trying to get across. And so I would use my sons as a, a kind of a sounding board to see how it was. And even now that my sons are all grown and they say, no, no, dad, you shouldn't use that. Let's not do that. Let's let's do this. And so it's very important for us to connect. You know, I, I remember that uh, uh, a while back I was listening to uh, the uh, service that they actually, the uh, funeral service that they actually had for uh, Jim Henson. And one of the things, and towards the end of his life, he was trying to uh, get Disney to purchase the Muppets. That's, that's what he was trying to do. But Disney, for the longest time, kept saying, no, we want Sesame Street too. We want the Sesame Street puppets too. And he kept resisting. And it went on for probably five, eight years. And, every, and the holdup was, we want Sesame Street. And he always was just, no, Sesame Street puppets are not are not in the deal. And, and just think about, had Jim Henson uh, uh, decided that he was going to give in and let Disney have Sesame Street, I don't think it would have been the same, same impact. I don't think it would have been the same company. I don't think they would have developed. Disney is good at what they do. But what Disney does is not what Sesame Street is doing. And so I'm so glad he held out. I'm so glad that he said, no, no, you can't have them. You can't have them. Even though uh, Disney kept saying, no, we're, we're not going to make the deal until this happens. He held out. And I'm, I'm so thankful for that. Because the message that we're doing is so important to the audience and to the man who Jim Henson was. I'm so glad. Me too. Me too. That difference between service and and selling, and certainly, um, as Leonard and I and other uh, uh, creators know on the other side, it costs money to make uh, a children's show. Felt's not free, al although going through the alleyways helps a lot with getting materials. <laughs> but it it costs money to make that stuff, and figuring out ways to do that, it's it's important. But you do not have to compromise your values on 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 certain things, and. Um, yeah, I think I think you're right. I mean, you know, it's something else I talked about with Craig um, Sherman, and I think he would be open to be talking about this is a lot of people assume um, Sesame Street has plenty of dough coming in. Their characters are on a lot of stuff from apples to juice boxes to granola bars. But that funding is going back into the show, the show that we, we enjoy through the screen. But think of the outreach that they do um, it, nationally and internationally. internationally. Yeah. yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that that's a major, it, it, it's, it's mind boggling, isn't it? It's, it started as an educational series, a show, but has grown really into this worldwide service. But the thing is, oh, in 69, yeah. as it is today, talking about yes. that thread is their commitment to show, social impact. Yes. Yeah. And so it's only grown and grown and grown and expanded, but at its core, it's, to me, it's still that same that same crux. Their commission, their commitment to um, having a social impact, and through that educational program, you know, really um, 
centering on social justice in the way that they do. And I, I don't think they that has gone astray. <laughs> I don't think so either. They they hold true to that. And and I'm getting a lot of very specific questions about um, Sesame Street and Sesame Workshop. And and I, I do want to be clear that although we are discussing Sesame Street from our perspectives as as educators and puppeteers and, and the affiliate station here in Maryland and how we serve the local community, we, we are not speaking on behalf of Sesame Street, the Jim Henson Company, and Sesame Workshop. Um, we're in awe of them and we are part <laughs> In, in partners with them in some ways, uh, but some of some of your very important and, and thoughtful questions um, we we talked about ahead of time. Some things we cannot uh, address, and I apologize if you feel like we're not talking about those really interesting uh, um, specifics. Um, I'm always open to conversations offline if anyone wants to contact uh, me through uh, Dejo's Treehouse. I love talking about this stuff. Um, as we're finishing up, we have about five minutes left. Um, we have time for a Q&A from our audience. Um, so with, with what I just said in mind, please share some more thoughts and ideas and feelings. We're really excited to um, have that conversation with you. Hopefully, this is just part of an ongoing conversation. We would in the future, through the Maryland Center for History and Culture, um, like to bring representatives from Sesame Workshop into the conversation so they can speak to some of these specifics. Hopefully, that's something we can make happen. Um, but as you're, you're thinking about what you might want to say, uh, I thought we could look forward. We've talked about the past. We've talked about the present. We've got a little bit into the future when thinking about mass communication and new tools. Um, what are you feeling hopeful for? I, as I've been going out to the schools here in, in Baltimore and doing my library tour this summer and opening up with the, the open questions of how do you think this puppet's feeling today, people naturally project. And once that door is open, people are ready to talk about their feelings, not just little kids, but adults too. We're all still feeling pretty overwhelmed. Um, as you're um, thinking about reassurance, um, what are you hopeful for with um, how we communicate through the screen? What have you been seeing with Sesame Street and how they've been representing this moment? Um, what what would you like to see in the future? This is a real, op we're going to end it with a real open-ended conversation. Um, the future is not decided. We decide what happens in the future. So keep that in mind as we're having this conversation. But Carla, what, what are you hopeful for through M MPT and, and as a, a educator yourself with technology and, and young kids moving forward? I would say that um, personally, myself and the role that um, I can provide as an educator and in support of educators is just continuing to develop um, those safe spaces for the people that we work with and serve to normalize their own feelings and in, in terms of being able to process. I feel a lot of times that a lot, well, I know that a lot is put on, um, you know, the early care providers and educators and for as much as they do in their commitment to providing um, high quality care and education to these young children that they serve. Who's, it's like, who's serving the server? <laughs> That's it, right? I'm so glad you're being And so um, in the ways that we can, you know, we are very clear and are cognizant of that and recognize and acknowledge that it, it just as an example, you know, in family care, that can be a very isolating space because you're not in a, in a center, you're not with a lot of other adults and you're committed and you're doing this work, but where's your network? Who are you having a space to debrief, <laughs> let down, and then um, strategize? You know, it's it's like, how, do, how can we be solutionary? I know that's not really a word, but I love it. Um, okay. And brainstorm and find, you know, reframe challenges for opportunities. So for me, it's like this um, space of normalizing that and then moving that forward. So I would like, I know that we have started that through our program. It's called Early Learning Social. It started during the pandemic for obvious reasons, um, and it has grown. And each year we look at it. Um, we, we do surveys to figure out how can we best 
meet the needs of the community that we're serving. So as that continues to grow, I, I, my hope is to see that opportunity to more broadly normalize that kind of exchange and feeling. Oh, I'm right there with you. And I think there is there is that opportunity with with our tools for communication. Hopefully, ha we have face to face communities that we mm -hmm. can take advantage of locally through our local affiliate stations and through museums like the Maryland um, Center for History and Culture. I know they're going to be launching a learning lab that they hope to be a, a safe place for teachers and parents and young children to continue learning. Um, we can have these in person places, but we, we can also use these tools to build real real human relationships, because it is important to know you're not alone and the things right. that are stressing you out. It's not just you. you. You are not you are not the only person feeling um, overwhelmed. We are with if, if someone hasn't said it to you in a while, we're with you. You're, you are not alone. Right. Exactly. Um, you know, and, and that can be enough. I, that's something I learned from Sesame Street. We're not here to fix the problem for you. We are just we're just with you. We can talk about it. We can process it. Mm -hmm. um, Leonard. What are you what are you thinking about with 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 the future and in, in your work and what are you hopeful for and and uh, what would you like to see from from Sesame Street and technology and all those all those big questions? The overall uh, concern that I have, I know Sesame Street is in good hands and uh, they probably anything that I say won't add to what they're doing, but I do have a concern about the art form of puppetry, you know. Hmm. When you look at a lot of the original puppeteers of Sesame Street are probably like me in their 70s or 60s and whatnot and all. So it's very important to pass this uh, torch. What am I looking for? This uh, torch, maybe? or uh, Yeah, the torch on. Or a puppet. <laughs> uh, to, uh, to allow people to learn this craft. And I and so as uh, some, now Ebony Sunshine puppets, uh, we're in the Fort Washington part of Washington D.C. And one of the things that we do is we allow high school students the opportunity to get uh, community service hours, and we teach them how to do puppetry because I want this art form to go on. And so if you're in, in that in our area in Fort Washington, you want to go to uh, Ebony Sunshine, that's sonshine.org, and you can go to our website and you can and let us know that you're interested in learning how to, to learn this trade of being a puppeteer. And I'm sure I could probably talk to Chloe and the Maryland Center for History if we wanted to have some classes up there, so those people who are in that area want to continue to learn how to do this art form, we'll be more than uh, helpful in doing that. And like I said, if you, they're interested in getting community service hours, we are a nonprofit organization, so we can give community service hours if for senior high school seniors and who are interested in, in giving some community service hours and having fun too. That's wonderful, Leonard. And by the way, um, uh, Chloe jumped in from Maryland uh, Center for History and Culture and said, yes, come on down, Leonard. It's important that uh, that that outreach. Um, we also got a message from Blake who says, Sesame Street is one of those few um, pieces of media that make me hopeful for the future. It doesn't have to be cheap pandering and dumb gags to be successful. There is a place for lovingly and thoughtfully made art. To see Sesame Street still running amidst so much low quality media makes me a uh, little more <laughs> optimistic. Uh, Blake, I'm with you. And 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 you know, folks, I, I can say, um, it's harder to find. There's a lot of noise in today's media landscape. Um, in in on my in my world of YouTube and streaming, but there are a lot of people who are influenced by the greats like Sesame Street, and Mr. Rogers, and so many so many other shows um, of our childhoods. 
it's just harder to find them, but they they are they are out there. Um, uh, again, you are not you are not alone, and you have a voice too. You 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 can express your your voice in so many wonderful ways, um, Blake and everyone else who might be listening to this now and and after this. Uh, this program is being recorded. You'll be able to check it out later. We have reached our one hour um, marker, and I don't see any other notes so i'm just going to say thank you so much thank you leonard um thank you carla um thank you chloe for having us at the uh, maryland center for history and culture virtually uh, it's been a real joy and i hope we can uh, continue the conversation and i'm going to plug myself too. check out danny joe's treehouse you're always welcome thank you for moderating the day danny i enjoy the conversation my honor Thank you all. Um, I'm going to go ahead and jump back in because as Danny said, we have reached the end of our time, but of course the conversation does not stop here. Like he mentioned, the program will be recorded and it will be posted on our virtual program archive and some of the wonderful resources that you saw today, especially the resources plugged by Carla and Leonard, Ebony Sunshine website, the thinkport.org with MPT resources and Danny Joe's Treehouse website will all be sent in this follow-up email. Uh, we also have a lovely little feedback form. We would love to hear from all of you. If you loved our conversation, if you want us to do more, if there's anything we can do better, um, just let us know in that feedback form. It always helps us improve these programs. But thank you so much, Danny, Carla, and Leonard. This was such a beautiful, wonderful conversation and we've been working on it for months and it was such a joy to have it happen today, <laughs> even though it came and went so fast. Um, and thank you to our wonderful audience for tuning in. We so appreciate your time. Um, those of you at the Puppetry Festival, please have fun, drink water, stay cool. Um, I was there yesterday. It's a bit of a hike and it's a little hot, but um, I hope you all have a great rest of your day and please come down and visit us and see the Jim Henson exhibit soon and hopefully have fun with MPT. Give Leonard a call for all your puppetry needs or give Danny a call for puppetry needs with some cookies for breakfast. No shortage of fun things out there. And don't forget the banana phone when it rings, pick it up. <laughs> Thank you all and y'all take care. Okay. Thank you. Bye.